Well, hello and good Sunday afternoon. I'm Kathleen Staten, Marketing and Events Associate for Ars Lyrica Houston, and we'd like to welcome you to our 13th Concert and Conversations episode and our very first Sunday afternoon version of that. For the summer, we've changed our schedule up so you can find the new schedule online at our website, www.arslyricahouston.org. Um, but I can tell you now that you'll see us here Sunday afternoons at four with Concert and Conversations. Our musical moments moves to Saturday morning, but don't worry, Baroque Cocktails is still Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. I am especially delighted to introduce this episode of Concert and Conversations because it is my colleagues who joined me for this particular uh, particular show. Um, I used to play the Baroque oboe. In fact, I was privileged enough to get to play with Matthew and the Ars Lyrica Orchestra many years ago. And uh, so we are about to sit down with Joel Robinson, who is an expert, absolute master builder and collaborator, as well as some of the great musicians who play his oboe, including Steve Hammer, Sarah Duvall, and Pris Priscilla Herod. Uh, we'll hear from them and of course also some music on the beautiful instruments that Joel has crafted. Um, something singular about what you're about to hear is that Joel isn't just a maker and a builder, but he is um, an absolute partner in music making with all of the people who play on his instruments, whether it's clarinets, bagpipes, shams, or oboes. Everybody has a chance to work with Joel and make their instrument exactly what they want and what they need it to be. So without further ado, I give you Joel Robinson and his oboists. So Priscilla Harriet is here, um, and Sarah Duvall, and of course, Steve. Okay, I'm Steve Hammer. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, before that, I lived in New York for a long time and worked with Joel developing a model of German-style oboe, uh, which we called Saxon oboe, uh, and also some uh, treble and alto shams um, starting in the mid-1980s. Hi, hi, I'm Joel Robinson, and uh, I started instrument making a real long time ago, first with harpsichords, actually, and I had studied modern ovo, but uh, I like working with machinery, so uh, in the mid-70s, I started making uh, wind instruments. The first, actually, is, is my interpretation of uh, one of the bagpipes in the marginalia of the Consigas de Santa Maria. Uh, so that, that was about my first instrument. Now we're talking about the mid 70s. Uh, I hadn't, while, while I had played although I hadn't gotten into making copies of them until uh, I started working for Philip Levin in 83 uh, and uh, worked on a few things, a lot of instruments for him. Uh, and uh, we, we all started, that is we, uh, Phil, and, and Steve Hammer and myself started on the oboes at about 86 or 87. And uh, Steve and I have been collaborating ever since. Well, I know, in I, fact, before I, I, you got online, Joel, I was talking with Sarah about uh, being in your workshop. And so I think maybe that's a, a great place to start. Uh, maybe, Steve, could you talk a little bit about um, the partnership that you had with Joel? And then if we can all think about our fond memories of being in that <laughs> Let's see, we were talking about the need for a German style oboe. Um, since a lot of the music we played were from uh, that part of the world, um, uh, the, the stains of the oboes we were playing on were ideal for French music and for Handel. Um, but uh, music from Dresden, such as by Zelenka, uh, required. Um, a better chromatic scale than was available on the um, on the Stainsby, and the uh, the Bach cantatas that we were being called on to play uh, had a lot of uh, lyrical vocal writing, and the oboe has to imitate the voice. Um, and um, the the French style oboe is, I think of it as a noble sound. Uh, it was designed originally to. He played outdoors and in ensembles. Um, 
but it's a relatively uh, cylindrical bore compared to the German style oboes that were being made. So in the mid eighties, I've been working uh, with Jonathan Bosworth build, building Stainsby style oboes. And uh, we started experimenting with German style instruments, uh, which was a bit of a complication uh, because uh, in the present era, we have standardized on a 415, um, a half step lower than um, modern pitch uh, for only that reason. But in Germany, uh, standard pitches were generally higher than that. So the uh, original German style oboes tended to sit around 425, 430, um, and none of them were ideal. So we were, I was, I've been experimenting with Jonathan on various uh, ways to modify this to get a lyrical chromatic oboe with, uh, in the German style, which had a somewhat more kind of a In the mid eighties, Jonathan, for various reasons, didn't have access to his shop. And I've been playing with Phil Levin, the instrument maker and bassoonist in New York. And Phil said, well, why don't you work on a new design in my shop and work with Joel Robinson? So I thought that was a fine idea. And uh, basically drew from scratch the bore of a new German style logo. Um, and Joel started making it. And I think it was 85, maybe, or it might have been 86. Um, and um, we've been making them ever since. Uh, you know, I don't play plural hobo. And so it is, it is Steve that takes what I make and turns it, he's responsible for turning this thing into a great musical instrument. Through all of his insight uh, accumulated over all these years, uh, uh, especially about board design. Uh, that is that is that is Steve's work, and I want to make it clear that that credit is due to him. Uh, we've had a great collaboration now for going on what thirty years. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I wanted to make that clear. That that's true with all the other instruments too. Uh, I collaborate with great players who understand the acoustics of the thing. But Joel, you understand yeah. the nuances, the like you were talking about the metallurgy and the little details that make it possible for um, for everyone here to be a stellar player. Um, I remember sitting in your very um, a drafty <laughs> workshop and, and it just had to be just perfect the way that the keys would be and that they wouldn't make noise and that it would be just how we wanted it to feel. So um, I think uh, I'd love to hear Sarah or Priscilla also talk about just uh, what it means to have someone like you and Steve dedicated to making these instruments um, as, as workable and uh, professional as possible, especially given the fact that it's not like you order these machines and reamers off of Amazon, you know, you're creating the things that you use to create with. So it's a, it's an ongoing building experiment on all sides. I started out on one of the, um, one of Steve and Steve's Stainsby's. And then I went to one, uh, Schlegel that I bought from James Caldwell. And then I went to a Saxon and I have to say, when I got to the Saxon and, and worked with Joel and Steve on what I wanted, I've now, I think I'm on number six and I've constantly evolved what I like and what I didn't like and sold things and then I actually even bought one back and altered it. But what's so wonderful about working with Joel is, I mean, at one point we were discovering about the high G and A and, um, you know, getting it to be secure and, that the throat of the bell was a big difference. And so we tried different incarnations with, and tried um, some inserts. And then <laughs> he took copious notes, which was so helpful. And we discovered that what one of my colleagues and I both wanted were, was within like a hundredth of a millimeter, exactly the same. So that two people were working with him like this and we met and we, and then that ended up being a bell that I liked. And so it was just, I just have always been so grateful working with both Steve and Joel in, you know, both playing and making and all the knowledge that you have, Steve, and all the knowledge that you have, Joel, to be able to play an oboe that takes your air well, that has a good scale. 
I mean, I, I think it's really the most wonderful oboe to play Bach with which to play Bach is, you know, it's, um, it can do all those things Bach requires. And that's what I found wasn't the case with the stains. Um, and so I just am very grateful and I miss Joel. And, um, I actually have a picture of your parakeet, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> actually, they were resident in the, in the studio because you shared it with oh. Leslie maker that studio. Oh, yeah. The cage was a modern art project, wasn't it? Oh, one of them, yes. These are Leslie's projects. One of them was. It was an article of that she literally wore that was made out of chicken wire so the birds could fly around in it. Yeah, Leslie did a lot of uh, fascinating things, uh, <laughs> you know, other, uh, in addition to making the spoon. <laughs> you, you know, something I, I want to make so, so, so clear is that these instruments all, that I deal with are living projects. We, you know, we constantly uh, assess them and, and uh, you know, working, and it's, it's by working with the great players, whether they're old boys, but, you know, like you all are, or song players or bad fight players, there's always this feedback from people who do it every day. I don't do it every day. I drag out my song moves like right now. <laughs> work on that they're all living projects as we continually assess well what what is going to make this desktop better speaking of nasty notes you know and, and, and steve in this case you know I, I start you know arriving at an understanding and we're not reinventing the modern oboe for heaven's sakes these are tiny tweaks to the bore for example thing is that i also play two of Joel Shams, and at one point I had to play a Broadway show in which I played a Sham in unison with a modern violin section. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, imagine I remember that, that. Ellen. And he got a sheath so that it could be tuned, you know, in the middle. He and Steve worked together, I guess, on this, I'm assuming. And I was able to do it. I was able to play Sham in unison with a modern violin section on Broadway. <laughs> so that was quite, uh, I, I just, you know, my admiration and gra gratitude is boundless that's a, that's quite the testimony yeah. <laughs> <laughs> priscilla tell us how did you come across joel and choose these instruments as uh your voice well i i have a roundabout way of getting to the baroque oboe particularly but also to joel's baroque oboes and that's that i was first a recorder player and then played shams uh, played modern oboe and but then played Shams before Baroque oboe. And um, I was working with Bob Winken in Philly and we would go up to Joel's shop. <clears throat> and I remember you were working on, I think it was the prototype of the D440 Sham. Joel was probably 2007. Oh, yeah. like that. And Bob and I drove up to, to Essex and Delancey and it was very warm <laughs> we spent, I remember there were a couple of us there and I think you were just tuning the F all day. That was all we were working on was, was like the note F. And, and I remember oh, yeah. this was, it was a brand new world to me, but I was also just in awe of the meticulousness and the beauty that you were striving for and the, the copious notes and the, you know, do one little thing here and then all three of us who are there play it for each other and for Joel and it was just it was it was it was really it was a complete learning experience for me and um and and then I just so because I went to Temple University where Bob ran the collegium he happened to have two Saxons at Temple and because I was an oboe major I got to try them and so the first oboe I ever played was a Saxon and um now, funnily enough, now the the Saxon that I play is the very first one <laughs> that was that Joel. You didn't even think you made that. it. You thought Jonathan made it. No, no, no. That's one. Yeah. Of, that's one of Joel's. Yes, you you two can talk about that <laughs> because I, I remember talking to Joel and he said, "No, I was no, uh, I was involved <laughs> or something." We're just talking about your Opus One. What number are you building now? Well, yeah. we started at one hundred. <laughs> and you're that's correct. You know, and that, you know, that 
Well, that, that, was, that, that was the thing Phil wanted to do. He thought, he thought nobody would want to have one that had the number one on it. So he's, <laughs> he, we, we started at 100. Yeah, I know uh, that's funny. Yeah. And, it, and, it, then, I, uh, I, and we're, we're up to the, the high 200s now, isn't it? Around 280. So there have been 180 or 190 of them. Yeah, a heck of a load. That's the technical term. Hey, Joel, tell us about the wood, because I know that getting the source of it and the aging of it and the handling of it can impact so much the instruments. Yes. How it impacts it mostly is, is whether it's going to work or not. It's, you know, it's, all, it's all boxwood, a uh, box of sympathians, uh, which is a common European species. However, just a couple of years ago, I got a hold of uh, a, a boxwood, uh, a two boxwoods in South Africa, and this box was Makawani, and uh, it, it is working very well. In fact, the last couple oboes, that was the wood of the top two joints. This, 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 this boxwood, the Makawani, is not available in thick enough to make bells out of. So the bells for those instruments are European boxwoods, simply uh, it, it is an issue. I mean, it should sit around and be tortured by, you know, well, out here it is tortured. We've got, in the Northwest, we've got soaking wet winters. And then we've got three of the driest summers I have ever lived. <laughs> uh, specifically, uh, a, a, a box with it, whose store he uh, turned me on to an English uh, cutter. And that uh, is, it will be the next complete instrument. Completely out of out of this person's work. Yeah, yeah we, we we should talk about Hugh, Hugh a little bit um, at the um, Isle of Man Festival and competition about fifteen years ago. I met a fellow named Hugh Crompton, who was a botanist and a tree specialist. I don't know what. Um, and at the time, he was promoting a project for ethically sourced. African blackwood, which is a real problem. There's a lot of uh, blackwood poaching in Kenya and so on. So he was uh, involved with uh, defining plantation and and keeping them away from the poachers and um, like that. And I and I asked him, had he had he ever thought of working with boxwood? And he hadn't. But he happened to know some people in the Chilterns who had. Uh, a sand of boxwood, so he investigated, um, and is planting new boxwood seedlings. They take about a hundred years to grow, uh, but he's been so. Uh, we're set for wood in about a hundred years, but he also had uh, access to some three hundred year old boxwood trees. So about six years ago, he. He wrote me and said, we're cutting down a few of these trees. Would I like some of the wood? Um, and um, so Joel was able to work with him and get some of it cut up and sent over. It, it, it takes a long time to season. When I say it's just now getting ready. So it'll be, uh, be, able, it'll be able to have oboes from wood that was alive when Handel was alive. It, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, this tree was planted, this tree that I got the most the shipment from was planted in 1721 Ugh. on some kind of aristocratic oh. estate. <laughs> yeah, they can be incredibly, it can be 30 feet tall, but hundreds of years old. Very slow, very slow growing. Because boxwood is slow growing, it has to be planted on in particular terrain so it'll survive. It has to... Um, generally, you want soil that's loose and shifting and a little chalky and on a hill. So uh, why do we use boxwood for historical instruments? I know some other makers have used grenadilla, and of course, that's what you normally see, except for some more exotic types of lorets and things these days. So why boxwood? It's very well, resonant. It machines, it machines beautifully. And for, for, for an instrument maker, uh, the problem, one of the problems with dark woods like, like uh, uh, you know, like uh, African blackwood, is it is very abrasive. It will take the cutting edge off the tool so quickly, you're constantly uh, uh, sharpening tools. Boxwood does not do that. But both woods, you know, provide what 
what a, what a, what the player is after. You know, we're going by what the player is after. So yeah, I have made saxons in ages ago in African blackwood, as other makers have also, and blackwoods. Uh, are, 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 are most of the great Dutch instruments, like the Richter, uh, gosh, they, they were made of blackwood. And why? Because Holland had colonies in Africa that produced, whether that was the source of the blackwood. Interesting. Huh? <laughs> blackwood was fairly common in Europe at the time. Every, every Oh, oh it was in your backyard. Every two-bit estate would have hedges made out of boxwood, so they would cut some down and make instruments out of it. And uh, an, an interesting phenomenon, the first oboe I copied with John Bosworth uh, belonged to Robert Rosenbaum in Scarsdale, and it was made of boxwood, but was stained very dark to imitate, yeah. to imitate African blackwood. <laughs> Um, yeah. you, you could put iron in nitric acid and brush it on the wood and it would make it almost black. Um, mm -hmm. And they would do that to, to make it look more luxurious. They would make it with uh, <laughs> imitation blackwood and ivory, of course. Ivory was fairly common too. Yeah. Now, now, now Katie, you, 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 you talk about metallurgy. Well, it's really, it's really not an issue of the brass keys. <laughs> made out of brass, brass, and sometimes people want a silver key, but I keep, I tell them, look, it doesn't look good on <laughs> stained boxwood. You go with the brass, right? <laughs> but what's more important with metallurgy is actually the type of tool steel that's used to make the reamers. <laughs> ah, oh, that's interesting. Can you talk about that? Oh, oh, well, all right, all right. I can be very specific. It's generally what is known as oil hardening tool steel. Tool steel is 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 iron that whose primary alloying element is carbon. The presence you heard of carbon steel, like carbon steel knives. Well, that's what makes it uh, hard enough to keep, to be sharpened and then to maintain the edge. But there are various other types of steel uh, because you, you you make a tool. Out of tool steel, and then you have to uh, uh, heat treat it, which is what, in part, by getting it red hot and then plunging it in water, is what imparts the uh, hardness to it. Right. And you know that that's something you know I deal with every time I make a little turning tool or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, the key work is just digital brass. The idea, though, that you're that you're creating all of these tools and building these tools to to make the instruments happen is just unbelievable to me. I can't I can't really process that. How has your move to the West Coast affected your ability to collaborate? Because everybody on this call are East Coasters or were, Steve. <laughs> well, were he was, yeah. It, what you see, I have always had to send instruments like to Steve. Or, or, or now, uh, you know, w with Jeffrey in Philadelphia, I've always had to send instruments. So it really has made no difference. You know, the biggest difference, uh, I have, Steve and I have had instruments with, you know, with conservatories throughout this country for a long time. But what was a great delight for me is that uh, back, what was it? Well, Priscilla would know when, when Juilliard started its program. I yes. had, I had, I had these great young players in my backyard. So, you know, I could go up to Juilliard for all of the recitals, three things. Oh, it was great. You know, after the recital, we all get up and give each other hugs. Nothing better, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of fun with the uh, concert. That I miss. Of course, you all, I, I miss very much you're dropping into the shop and talking about things. That I miss very much. You know, that we miss you a lot. In fact, see this little bent <laughs> pod? That means now I can't just run down to Houston Street um, crossing <laughs> the land and get you to right. give me a new rod or fix this one. I have to send it. <laughs> and then I don't get to visit. Well, so we miss you a lot. I know. <laughs> In fact, that's a brilliant so, segue. I was wondering, well, 
Can you all can you all say something about uh, something that you miss about uh, working with Joel or a favorite memory that you have? I I'll never forget sitting there with wood shavings everywhere and maybe a few mice or two um, after getting off the elevator that you had to crank yourself that never really stopped at the floor exactly um, <laughs> and wondering if I was going to make it down alive. Um, but I will never forget you studying Greek while and talking about travels and language uh, while I was sitting there having. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always had great conversations. I got so, to yeah, I, I, I see people. Luckily, Pardon my husband's from Oregon. Oh, I said, luckily, Grant's from Oregon, my husband. So we went out and uh, stopped at Joel's, and he <clears throat> did a little work on my elbow before we went up to see family. So I was able to write off the vacation. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course, Priscilla. I'm sorry. I guess you have you were here. No, no. Right. <laughs> That's just a bonus of like going to Oregon is that you are there. So at least we could see. You. I remember I have a couple memories of going to the shop <clears throat> in New York, and I remember <laughs> one was probably the first time I went. I was probably 18 or 19 years old, and um, I ran down while you were hard at work on something to feed the meter, and I got down. I like figured out the elevator somehow and got down and there was a cop writing a ticket and I said no I'm here I've got the money I'm here I'm here I'm here and he and he was like well, I'm already right and I said no because I didn't understand that like and I said no please I'm here I've got the quarters and he's like all right and he walked off and I went upstairs and I said the cop was there but he didn't give you a ticket and both <laughs> you and Bob were like what <laughs> 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 that was a huge yeah, yeah. That I didn't appreciate until I drove and parked in New York myself but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's 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 a real pain. And did you, you know, find something your way I, back up, Priscilla, without a map and breadcrumbs? You found your way back up. I did find my way back up. I I heard the call of the shawl yeah. and I got my way. <laughs> well, I'm ah, hearkening ah. for that elevator when you had to walk up the stairs and you walked by the garment sweat <laughs> on right. floor two and floor three with all the ladies and sometimes very young ladies working on material yeah. on sewing machines and then the next one i don't know what they were doing and you know and so that was always like oh my goodness and then and, and then yeah, the violin the, shop in the middle it, exactly the violin oh, shop yeah. violin shop sweatshop dual shop yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, you got it, great it, exercise climbing those stairs <laughs> i used to carry i carried my bike up and down those steps that's right i, I still have it of course well it's a very fine bike would have been stolen in a nanosecond. So I carried it up. It was a big deal. I was uh, so yeah. muted from Staten Island on your bike. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, yeah, to, I, I, yeah. I commuted to the ferry from from both sides. Yeah, that was a long time ago. It was a short time I was there. Well, we talked a little bit about um, what the, I love the, actually the dialogue about the boar quality and the nationalization of them. Um, and I asked you all for favorite recordings where you were playing an instrument of bulls. But if you could talk to um, what you're able to do, why that recording is so important to you and how the oboe uh, allowed you to do what you did, I would love to hear that. Oh, you're talking to me now? I'm sorry. No, now you just get to sit back and listen, Joel, to um, three amazing voices talk about um, why playing your instruments allowed them to um, achieve musical excellence. Well, Katie, the one I, I remember comes right to mind, which has two of our Saxon oboes on it, was when we did three of the Zablenka sonatas, and, and I also recorded the Vivaldi C minor sonata uh, for Dorian right before they went bankrupt. Um, but fortunately, I was able to get the tapes and put it, put it out. So, um, and it, it, so it isn't really possible for me on, on, a, on a Stainsby style over. Uh, just the, uh, the chromaticism is so um, pervasive. Uh, you, you need a, a certain amount of evenness through the cross fingerings that you need a German style for. Um, so I was delighted to have those oboes at that time.
I mean, I even remember we were talking so much of this as we recorded in Troy about um, being able to spin the sound. And I know you can't do that on all instruments, you know, to create that active, um, moving feeling uh, with your air. And I know on Joel's oboes, I can still hear it in the recordings when I listen to it um, in those long notes. Um, and yeah, I mean, even this is like, this is 2001. So we're talking about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the oboe still, uh, you know, it was, I felt like I could do and say anything musically that I wanted to. Yeah, that's a, that's a great recording. I would have to say Handel, Bach, and Vivaldi. <laughs> you know, those three. And um, I, I, I'm i particularly fond of the Vivaldi D minor concerto, which has, uh, it has a lot there. It goes up to D a lot. The slow movement really is very chromatic. Um, and I feel like um, that this oboe, you can get the full range of the oboe. I mean, I feel that some of the other makers of very oboes, you, certain registers are great and vibrant, but to really flip up to a high D or do a very um, elaborate ornamentation for a slow movement, it's um, this instrument has that flexibility, and as you said, it's like this. It will take it will take your air.
the, the piece that I feel like more than anything that I recorded, I don't have a video, but it's a recording, is um, the F major mass. I recorded that and I've played it a number of times and I feel like I would not want to play that piece on anything but one of Joel's and Stephen's um, Saxons because um, that requires so much and that's big slow movement, you know, that you have to go the full length and it actually uses every note on the oboe, every single note. Um, I call it the 12 tone aria because yeah. <laughs> it does, it uses every single note. Wow. <laughs> Priscilla? Um, yeah, I sent the uh, a, a video of a concert that I played the Bach double on last summer. And again, it's C minor, which is the saddest of all things. <laughs> sort of just, just having to constantly go between A flat and G, B flat and A flat. And, and the first movement is done and you're tired and have a lot of adrenaline and then you have to hit that low C in the second movement and just having no worries that the oboe is going to seize up or that it's going to be sharp or that even if you're exhausted that and you know and you're on your reserves that that those that opening passage of the second movement will be will be just fine and um the that spin that you're talking about is that's the word that I that I that comes to mind all the time when I'm playing his oboes and especially in Bach I think um when you have long phrases that explore a lot of different chromaticism and you also want to have some lightness to it, it just, again, I've only played regularly on saxons, but I've spent time trying other instruments and it just, <clears throat> there's no real comparison. really easy it's really easy to to play lightly to play forever to not have the sound get choked up and um and that and they just they're they're so beautifully made i've heard a handful at least of um instrument makers that will say this is how my instrument works you have to figure it out and well that's a problem for you well you'll just have to <laughs> and joel is obviously throughout this whole call we've you know he's not that way. It's very much, he's working with Steve, he's working with Bob, he's working with Jeffrey, he's working with players. He's, he, Joel, you seem to be so, it, it seems to be like a fun treat for you to find out what we want and to and to make it, I mean, Sarah, like spending time so that she can play the Broadway show on her show, just, you know, who does that? Who thinks that that's an important part of this business? And, Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's my response, it's the, the maker's responsibility. I want to, again, to, you know, speak of Bob Bimkin's contribution, his, you know, his approach to read making and his approach to keeping every little data point right on his computer <laughs> spreadsheet about all the details of his reads. I mean, if, if I didn't have someone so dedicated to making reads for this instrument, these instruments wouldn't be playing well. Also, for all the reed work that Steve has done, and, and work on staples, staples have gotten oh, so much solution. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I just so appreciate all the work you've done, Steve. It's just made our lives so much more, it, more easy.
<laughs> and are those, would you consider those, Steve, just well, an extension of the bore and the, the science of that? Well, um, th that's true more or less on a modern oboe. Um, uh, these historical instruments are complicated by the fact that they don't have a register key. So the same fingering has to function to play at least two notes sometimes. Um, so there have to be uh, spots where turbulence is intentionally introduced into the, uh, into the cone. So no, it's not as continuous for an early woodwind as it is for a modern one. Well, again, it's a, it's a continuously evolving art. You know, something people will very commonly ask when they see, because they know what a modern clarinet looks like, a modern oboe and bassoon covered with metal, right? They will often ask, well, what is the advantage, you know, of all, all these keys on an instrument? Well, my reply is something to the effect that on historical instruments, one hole, each hole serves many masters. When you have all the holes, like in a modern oak, with a 20 or something, you allow each hole to be optimized, optimized to a great extent. Uh, rather, but you see what I mean? You know, there are so many masters, like, like on the early clarinet, number four hole. Oh, because of the range of a clarinet? Wow. If it's not just like this and that is a problem, but then you compromise somewhere else. You know what I mean? Too many masters. <laughs> and then you add in the reeds. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think oh, that's forget that's about it. You know? Yeah, yeah. On on period instruments, the whole reed setup has to be so flexible to allow you to, you know, to kind of push things this way and that way compared to, you know, a modern modern reed instrument. Yeah, and also to take advantage of the craftsmanship of the instruments, because if you try and play a modern type setup that gives you ultimate control, you lose the rhetorical abilities that are built into the instrument itself. Baroque music is so much, is the reason to take up an oboe as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, absolutely. It is so demanding and everything, you're always playing marathons, right? <laughs> well, I was going to share that I actually met Joel when he was still working at the Levin studio in New Jersey when I was really oh, yeah, young years ago. and I was, yeah. I'll bring it up again. <laughs> I was part of a seven piece, all girl Sean band out of, uh, really? And, um, Oh no, he's going to show the picture. Um, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> hold it up closer. <laughs> Steve, tell us who's in that picture. I just, I just found this kind of crumpled up in the back of my file cabinet. This would have been, Sarah, I'm guessing 1970. No, nope, 80, 81. 81. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Allison Gangler on the, on the uh, bass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm next to her. Wow. With very short hair. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. I think this this call was worth just that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I am so Thank grateful you. to all of you for taking this time to chat with us today about this. I think um, recognizing the contribution that builders make to the evolution of this field is so important, and also acknowledging the players who've been part of it too, um, who who help bring the level of performance up to a, a, a global standard of professionalism. So I'm delighted to share your performances today and also your thoughts.